right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out tonight to um, see me do a song and dance or something like that. Um, obviously, I'm supposed to be really excited, so I guess I am. Um, I, I've tried to con David Hayes to kind of do this presentation for me. David is a also a St. Croix Historic Preservation Commission member, but um, he's just just not following through, and I guess I just have to do it. You wrote it. Yeah. So, anyway, let's let's begin. And and the function of this really is to to get some information out to the general public about what the Virgin Islands Historic Preservation Commission is and its function within the community. Um, and um, hopefully the information that we'll provide, and I do have some nice pretty pic pictures, so please don't worry. It's not just gonna be a bunch of words on the screen. Um, uh, hopefully we can learn some stuff together. So uh, as you can see, I'm uh, a St. Croix Historic Preservation Committee member and VA advisor to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, run my own practice, Tayer Larhas LLC, architect, do preservation, architecture, and other architecture here in the territory. So the commission is a regulatory commission. It's composed of two different committees. One is the St. Croix Historic Preservation Committee, which um, has the pur purview over St. Croix and its two historic towns. And St. Thomas, St. John Historic Preservation Committee uh, has jurisdiction in St. Thomas, Charlotte Amelie, and basically we have five committee members apiece. And the total, um, together, we, we, we are the VI Historic Preservation Commission. Now, this all sits under the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Um, the State Historic Preservation Officer, where all our power comes from, is um, under uh, DPNR Commissioner Don L. Henry who is an attorney, and of course we have a director of the Division of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, and Sean Krieger is that individual. And if you have projects within the, these districts, these are the people that you have to engage to get it done. So, what are the historic districts within the territory? One is where we are right now, is Christiansted, founded in 1734. It became a local historic district in 1998, but its fe federal designation was done in July 20th, 1976. We have Charlotte Amelie, founded in 1666. Its local historic district, which is the entire town, 1998, and the federal designation was July 19, 1976. And finally, Frederick said, founded in 1752, it became a local historic district in 1991, and its federal designation was August 9, um, 1976. So there are applicable, applicable preservation laws that guide us, and these are laws that are what we enforce. VI Code Title 29, the Antiqui Antiquities Law of 1998, and the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And it's interesting that the actual national, uh, Christian said uh, National Historic Site goes back to 1954. 52, and that precedes the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, so obviously even the federal government understood the value of these very historic places and made them special way back when. So I just wanna talk quickly, there's federal law and local law, and people sometimes don't quite understand. Federal law is set and their requirements, especially in these historic districts. The, the intent is a federal law is a baseline, and then local law should be equal or more stringent. Because the idea is that the local law, or the local individuals and the legis legislature, uh, should actually be a little more aware of what makes this place so unique and special. So our local laws have got to be equal or more stringent. Um, I have to say that uh, I've been on the commission for, for, for a while and part of some of the issues that we have I think is about messaging. And messaging, what, what I'm referring to is where people um, feel that we only describe these towns as being of some kind of a Danish origin. And I think what we have not quite done well enough is to make people understand, although it is of a Danish origin, it really is a fusion of Afro-Danish 
origin because it is the Danish architecture that was conceived and required to be built, um, which is a neoclassical architecture that's uh, Danish derivation and French derivation, um, but it's done by African craftsmen. So the style becomes a fusion of both and it becomes very specific to this place. And the territory then has this type of architecture. If you go to any other Caribbean islands that's fused with English and African builders or Spanish and African builders, each of these places has a very unique architecture. It has reminiscence of where it comes from, but it's actually very site specific. So I think the messaging in order to get the buy-in from everyone always is about telling the full story. So what is the premise that we have with the commission? My take on this is that we have Ferraris here and you have to treat a Ferrari a certain way, okay? It is extremely well built, a fine piece of architecture, okay? These buildings have withstood the test of time with minimal maintenance and care at times, and they're still standing. So there are Ferraris, they're made with certain types of materials that are so well selected and function so well in this climate that they have lasted and, and, and still are around. However, I think people today feel that they can take a Yugo and Yugo parts to fix the Ferrari. And that's not what we're here, here to do because we understand that, that the quality of the work is, is high and we have to try and make sure that we're fitting it with the right material. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So let's start with the definition of what a historic building is. And people sometimes don't realize that the definition is a structure or a place that is 50 years or older, which means that the buildings like Government House or the Moda House on the upper uh, right or my building, which is a 1954, I'll call it a Puerto Rican style house, um, is actually a historic building. Okay, and it, it makes sense because these buildings are not static. I mean, the his, people like to say, oh, it's only a Danish period, but this is over time. So what is today modern in 100 years becomes historic. Within 50 years, it becomes historic. So we have to treat these buildings as they come online in terms of their age with the same type of respect. And it's not one type of building is better than the other. It's all representative of how this place has evolved. So we have preservation guidelines um, in DPNR, and there are 16 of them. And uh, if you just look at the screen, you know, signage, paint colors and materials, plastic covered, plaster covered walls, brick walls, stone walls, wood buildings, windows and doors, porches, balconies, roof repair, architectural metals, lighting and mechanicals, landscaping, staircase and steps, new additions, new buildings, and interior changes. These are all the components and the parts of these buildings that we have jurisdiction to make sure that they're done and restored in a certain way. We use the Secretary of Interior Standards of Treatment for Historic Properties to make sure that it's done in a certain accordance because we are dealing with Ferraris. So there are four distinct treatments for historic properties as definitions. So if it's, a preserva it's preservation, which is focusing on maintenance and repair of existing historical materials and retention of a property's form as it has evolved over time, protection and stabilization has now been consolidated under this treatment. Another term that we use is rehabilitation, which acknowledges the need to alter or add to a historic property to meet continuing or changing uses while retaining the property's historic character. We do restoration, which depicts a property at a particular period in time of its history while removing evidence of other periods. And finally, reconstruction is a recreation of something that has vanished or is non-surviving, of whose proportions of a property is intended for interpretive purposes. Um, again, th this documentation, and I'm gonna probably post this on my website and blog so that all these documents and all this information is accessible to anybody who's really interested to, to read it. So um, it's really extensive. What's the website address? Um, the website address, and I'll, I'll, you'll see it at the end of the speech. Um, a, I'm just going to go through a couple of these things. A property will be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change 
to its distinctive materials, features, spaces, and spatial relationships. The historic character of a property will be retained and preserved. Um, each property will be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes to a property that have acquired historic significance in their own right will be retained and preserved. Distinctive materials, features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property will be preserved. We have all of these conditions here. Deteriorated historic features will be repaired. Chemical or physical treatment, if appropriate, will be undertaken. Archaeology resources will be protected and preserved. New additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction will destroy historical materials and features and spatial relationships that characterize the property. The new work will be differentiated from the old and will be co compatible with historic materials, features, size, scale, proportion, etc. And then new additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. Okay. So we do all these things because this place matters to us. And this is a concept and an idea that we all need to sort of embrace because when we do this, we're helping people protect, enhance, and enjoy these places that matter to them for us and for future generations. Um, another series of a lot of um, rich information about preservation, conservation issues is on www.preservationnation.org. And without uh, going into too much detail, there's a lot of statistical information that has been compiled about what doing construction uh, in terms of construction costs and demolition of a specifically old buildings. And actually, you'd be surprised at how much uh, demolition material is, um, the, the amount of percentage that ends up in the landfill that is very costly to, to lo localities, especially in a place as small as the Virgin Islands. And we are, already have consent decrees about moving our landfills. But if we were to really undertake um, kind of rampant dis demolition of our historic buildings, which some people sort of advocate, um, we can only imagine the amount of debris and the amount of extra material that would be going in there. And there's a, a cost to not only demolishing the, the building, which has a price tag, physical cost to, to demolish a building, the cost it takes to put that uh, material in the landfill, but then there's new construction costs. So when you talk about um, old buildings and recycling them, you're talking about being a lot more sustainable. And it's really the way to go under the con conditions that we, we have presently with global warming and other issues of uh, poor economies, et cetera. So there is a lot of information related to even energy efficiency, efficiency of historic and older buildings that surprisingly um, you would not realize. And many issues too that we presently face where you have buildings that are sick buildings, a lot of these older buildings which have very natural materials that were used don't have those issues. But when we start to climate control, um, not naturally, like um, air conditioning, and then we seal up buildings in uh, buildings that have so much moisture in the walls, uh, which we have in these historic buildings, you have a lot of conflict, mold generation, and a lot of issues that come from buildings that become sick. But o older methodologies are a lot more effective in ensuring the quality of the interior space. And going back to old practices is really a good way to solve those issues. So. Of course, here come some uh, really beautiful pictures. Um, Fort Frederick, uh, we're gonna start in Frederickstead, and obviously it's a VI government building. Um, some of the Frederickstead details, of course, are very unique to Frederickstead. After the fire burn in October 1st, 1878, you have uh, reproduction and a lot of what would be called Victorian details, and there's a lot of fretwork gingerbread, um, beautiful colors and proportions. And you have all these wonderful townhouses. Frederick said tends to be a little more, um, a little less formal. Um, it has uh, tends to have a little more masonry ground floor and wooden upper floors, and it's again in this very high Victorian style. And 
uh, something I always talk about is the endangered species of the, really the little vernacular cottage. Again, this is a testament to um, triumph in the face of adversity because you have these buildings built by enslaved Africans, uh, obviously who, um, some of them bought their freedom and were able to build very modest homes in very specific parts of the town. And they're beautifully constructed. Some of them are 200 years old, still standing and they're uh, beautifully mortise and tenon uh, constructed and they're really a testament to uh, a transference of wealth that's um, among uh, the enslaved African uh, population here that really needs to be preserved. Um, we're here in Christianstead now and this is a Jack Delano photograph from 1941. This is Prince Street here in Christianstead and you can see the, um, the rectory for Holy Cross Catholic Church all the way by the hill in the back. Now I put this picture in here to show you the quality of the street in 1941. And you can see how all these beautiful old vernacular buildings and some of the other detailing and all the shutters um, really make a very strong character um, and, and beautiful streetscape. And we're sort of diluting this in our present day by putting a lot of, uh, removing a lot of these details and not rebuilding them to match what we had. I also have this picture up here because I want to show you in color what the streetscape looked like. And again, these are very soft colors. And you'll understand later on when I talk about color. So Sunday Market Square, another um, rehabbed, this is about half of the square that's been restored. Again, the rich, um, beautiful uh, detailing, and you can see with the shutters, you can see the masonry buildings. Um, masonry, on the one on the right has a masonry base and a wooden upper floor, which sometimes can have a two-toned uh, color scheme, um, but very soft. Um, you have a very formal uh, building, which is a Cree building, which houses St. Croix Foundation. Uh, in 1866, this square was burnt, um, very much like the town of Frederick said was burnt. Um, and many of the codes were upgraded to ensure that the buildings were, were rebuilt in a stronger form. And that's what you have typically in Christian said, a little more of the masonry buildings. And of course, you have some other details, some streetscapes, Company Street, you have a beautiful building at the end of Sunday Market Square. And of course, you have the beautiful Customs House and the wonderful entrance to the town of Christianstead. And again, here is another vernacular house that has, was wonderfully saved be, by being placed on the VA Registry of Historic Places. This is the actual birthplace of Governor Melvin H. Evans. And, um, you know, the family at the time was say, thinking that they wanted to redevelop the lot and they wanted to take down this little cottage because they wanted to put a big building up. And again, it has not only a cultural reference because it, it's a, the first elected governor of the Virgin Islands, but it's also another vernacular cottage house that is a testament to um, the, the history of, of really the builders of the town. So it's a wonderful thing that that was done and it's protected now. Okay, let me see if I can get rid of that. Okay, so we're going to move forward. Okay, here are some examples of interior, what I'm calling mortise and tenon, which means that there is no screws or nails used. This is all a peg and mortar system where you could literally take this whole construction apart in, in pieces and put it back together. And this is exactly what these buildings are built, how, how they were built back then. And they can stand up in terms of hurricane, earthquake, etc. And it's fantastic construction that again should be brought back um, as, as a construction technique. So let's go into some rubs that we have. The Historic Preservation Commission, and I've been on it long enough, gets vilified left and right. We are horrendous, I'm told. We're evil. We make people do things they don't want to do. But the truth is, uh, let's see. People don't want to be told what to do with their historic property. Reality check. 
you are a steward of the property for a relatively short period of time. This historic building will outlive you guaranteed. So as much as you want, don't want to be told what to do with your historic property, today you own it, tomorrow you're not around. But the building will remain and the only way it can remain if it's kept and restored and maintained using the right methods. People want to paint their building whatever color they want, so don't tell me nothing. Reality check, these buildings have been analyzed and extensive research has been done to know what colors are in the layers of paint on them going back several hundred years. Get over it, especially when you want to cho choose fluorescent colors to paint your building. A former HPC member, Miss Norma Glenn, and I know she wouldn't mind me saying this, said it best, those colors are not historic and they are garish, okay? People say it's too expensive to fix up an old building correctly. Reality check, remember this is a Ferrari and Hugo parts just won't do, okay? And we're gonna go and look at paint now. It's really fascinating to me. These buildings have a lot of architectural detail. And in that essence, what was done in the past was basically whitewashing them. If it was a shingle building, it may have not been painted and it would have been uh, faded and become silvery. Um, if they did add color to a lime wash paint, it was an ochre color or possibly a rose color. But the, the, so you have to imagine way back when th these streets were, were basically very uniform. Uh, in color and shading and there were soft colors so beware let me give you some examples of where we are headed okay and these are on the outskirts of Christianstead one's in Gallup's Bay one's at the entrance to Basin Triangle and the other one was um, pretty close to um, uh, Five Corners and I'm not really sure what to say about the colors but one thing I can say clearly is that all you see is color. You don't see details on the building because what you're looking at is every color under the sun put together. The one on the top in Gallows Bay is a, uni it's, it's a Surlian kind of derived building, meaning it has two wings and a formal middle portion. And now it's like, I don't know, four or five different buildings, some color s schemes that I have no idea. This is what it is. I guess we are using Harlequin and Catalina macaws to, to select our building colors now. And as much as a tropical bird is a beautiful thing to look at, I'm not sure that it needs to be in our buildings. Okay? So, what do we do and what don't we do? So, we preserve, we conserve cultural resources. We are not a town council. We enforce guidelines, Department of Interior, but we do not clean debris from lots. We put historic building spaces in our VI registry of historic places, but we don't designate types of businesses and buildings. We control all exterior modifications to historic buildings, misspelled, um, but we don't um, actually have purview for the interior renovations, except if they are original. We issue violation notices and levy fines, but we don't adjudicate violations to the level outlined in the antiquities law. The preservation tools we use, engagement, uh, which is what we're doing here, hopefully, getting the community engaged. Uh, we have done partnerships and collaboration with different groups. We do advocacy. We try and educate. And obviously, there's a lot of incentives that we have built in to making preservation happen in the territory. So we have government incentives, and usually these are tax incentives, okay? They are very small amounts of grants that people can use to restore historic buildings. They're hard and uh, to find. Guaranteed, I've been on this commission long enough. If I had access to free money to fix up my buildings, they would be amazing. However, you have got to finance it but they are tax incentives when you do it and you go to the Historic Preservation Commission and you get it approved by us that you are qualified to get. And they actually can add up to a serious amount of money. Um, some of them are in the range of 25 to 35% off of your personal income tax up to f five to seven years. There is um, new enterprise zone 
town plan that was enacted that can actually, when you put new businesses into these buildings and restore them, that you get 90% off of your business tax, your property tax. There's some real interesting ways of of giving carrots to make sure people really do the right things with these buildings. But like I've said before, you have to come before the historic preservation and get it approved in order to qualify. Um, as you can see, the others are listed here. We've done scrape and paint through St. Croix Foundation and the EDA. Um, there's some cleanup and board up programs with the Law Enforcement Planning Commission. And also, we need some adjudicatory language in our VI Historic Preservation Law. And I'll quickly describe what I'm talking about. So if you get violations issued from the commission, because you did something really naughty with your building, that has to then go to the AG's office and it is a very protracted process in order for you to get the fines to make you do the right thing. If we had the same language that's in our VI Antiquities Law, which gives us the ability to fine you maybe a thousand, two thousand dollars, say stop, and then you come before the commission and then we negotiate the, the repairs or the solutions to the problem, we would see a lot more proper enforcement going on within these towns. And it's interesting because you have to look at our districts as if they were a homeowners association. What we do is to ensure that your property and your neighbor's property are held to the equal standard. So it's not as if you invest and you fix up and pay a lot of money for your building and your neighbor can then come and do whatever they want because what we want to do is have consistency within the town in terms of what it looks like, feels like, and preserves our cultural resources. Here are two examples and these are mine. So obviously I haven't done it yet, but it'll happen. So here's a little vernacular cottage and here's a 3D rendering of what it looks like when we put back the shutters and the louvered systems that were there. So when my grandfather bought this property in 1954 and it was in that wonderful period of time where America was, the, the best thing to do is to put Miami louvers because you don't need shutters anymore and you don't need to do any of these things. So this is the best thing since sliced bread. But what we ended up doing was taking away a lot of the character off of these buildings. And you can see from before and after, it's like night and day. Here's the other one, same thing. So hopefully, um, maybe by the end of the year, I'll begin doing this work on these cottages. And then the idea, again, is to make these po possibly some be bed and breakfasts that people can come and rent and stay in town. So. To kind of wrap up the presentation, I have to also include, and here's Rick Starr's um, beautiful four-poster bed, because this is another element uh, which is decorative arts. This, these are Crucian four-poster beds. And I think people can correlate a little bit better with why um, you restore build, um, something like a bed, because it has an immediate, tangible understanding. When it's done right, it's a beautiful, beautiful item, but also it increases its value. We should treat our Ferraris in the same way. Our buildings merit the same level of execution and increase in value when we do the right thing and do it correctly. Um, there was a wonderful level of uh, craftsmanship being done and a lot of innovation. So you see the four poster bed and the post, and I flipped the, the uh, card table, has the identical post as, as legs. And the proportions are beautiful on the, the, the turned legs on the card table as they are on the four poster bed. And then even on side tables, here's this Victorian detailing that you see in Frederick said translate onto the tables. So what are our needs? We need community activism. We need not only for the St. Croix Historic Preservation Commission or the St. Thomas Historic Preservation Commission to be the arm of the law. We need to do some self-policing. If you're in town, you have a property and your neighbor's doing something that you know is a violation, call the office. 
jump up and down or talk to them and say, hey, you know, this is a historic district and we have certain rules and regs. You need to follow them. I'm glad that you're doing something with your building, but please do it correctly. There are people here. The commission does um, even technical assistance where we actually have people can come in before they file a permit, uh, an application. They can come in and talk to us and we give them ideas on how to do what they need to do. I'm going to also recommend you contact senators. And I'm going to say specifically, you need to contact Senator Myron Jackson and ask him, where is our legislation to, to improve the enforcement capacity of our present VI historic preservation laws? You, we cannot adjudicate these things where, in the way that we could be extremely more effective, but you need to change the law. We expect him as the champion and being the former director of that division to be the one to bring this legislation forward. You as communi community um, members need to contact him also and tell him this is what we need to make our job easier. And then also as I am presenting is become uh, buy into what we are presenting here and become an advocate. I mean, there's nothing wrong f for you to say this town is beautiful. I would like to make sure that you take care of it in a certain way. And it's about people taking pride in the place that other people then will understand that this is what I can also do. And it's sort of infectious and hopefully everyone gets into the buy-in and understands wh why these rules and regulations are here. It's to make the place better for us all. Um, our culture matters to each and every one of us. So. HPC initiatives. We have been looking at ways if our laws are not strong enough, we're going to partner with other government agencies to achieve compliance and enforcement of the law. And this is how we do it. So we get an MOU with the Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs. Your business got a violation. We contact them. And when you come to renew your business license, either you fix the compliance and, the, and rectify the notice of violation or you're not going to get your business license. That's one way. Also, we're going to put on property tax the designation that your lot or your property or your house is in the historic district. If you have a violation and a fine is attached, then that will be part of your tax bill. I mean, we, we have to be creative to make sure that people understand that we are serious and that we really care. Um, we want to make sure that we do a little more community lecture and outreach, as I'm doing today. And also, we are going to kind of reinstitute some PSAs and really train younger audiences about the benefits of the law, the rules, and the regulations. I um, finalize any speech that I do. This is one of my favorite places, and it is uh, Gustavia in St. Bart's. And it's really fascinating to me because it's the scale of St. John. Um, but here is a little town in the Caribbean, and yes, everyone's going to say because it's got so much French money. Okay, wonderful, yes. However, look at this town, look at all the red roofs. There are little vernacular buildings through this entire town. They are high-end boutiques. They are restaurants. These are the same buildings we have here. And this is how they take care of them. They don't knock them down. They recycle them. They renovate them. They make them special because they are special. And that quaint town is one of the chicest places that you can be in the Caribbean. We have even more beautiful buildings here. There's no reason why we can't do it even better here. So. If you want to get some more information, like I said, I'll put the presentation on my website, which is www.tayirlahas.com. And if you want to get some more information on my take on how to paint buildings and not to paint historic buildings here in this territory, go to my HTTP WePreserveUSVIBlogspot.com. I thank you very much. I hope it was informative. I hope I was exciting enough. And if not, it's all good. So thanks for coming out. <laughs> questions. questions? Sure. So would you rather not? No, that's fine. I can take questions. <laughs> sure. Any questions? Don't be bashful. Do we need? How, how, where exactly, how can you find out exactly where the historic district is 
in okay, I'll, I'll put that on my website. Anybody else? Basically the whole town. Yeah, but it's effectively the whole town. But yes, but but it's very clearly delineated, and we do have the maps, which I will definitely provide. You mentioned that there are tax credits for individual income tax, and I wasn't sure whether you also mentioned whether there are tax credits for property tax. Yes. You, okay. Yep. Where is the information about that that can be obtained? Where can you find information about that? All these tax benefits are in the enterprise zone of the U.S. Economic Development Authority. That's where these programs are uh, situated within the VI government. You can contact that office. Um, Nadine Marchana is the director of that division of the EDA, and she can provide you with any of the information that I have discussed here in the lecture. Okay, I assume there's a website maybe for the EDA? Yeah, I think it is uh, usviEDA.com or something, but if you Google it, you can find it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Can you like, I got a question. Sure. I don't, I don't need the mic. No. Okay. Well, like, the mic is like, there. One of my aunts live in West Palm Beach County. Yes. And I know some years ago there was a small town that was built in 1920, the homes. Mm -hmm. And they were about to build, they decided that these were historical homes. Okay. And the homeowners were given funds by the county to upscale these homes mm -hmm. up to the historical standard. But of course, with a lot of stipulations, like mm -hmm. they, they couldn't sell the homes within ten years, it couldn't be a rental property, it had to be a certain code. So, so isn't there some type of incentive that the government could use, such as these counties, to do that? I mean, there, there must be something more that they can do. And I think what I what I hear from people out here locally is that funding. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think there's something more that can be done because other places it has worked. Yeah, and I, I fully agree with you. Um, I will say, though, that I think even though you can get grant money and you can set it up like you just described, you still have to invest a certain amount because I have seen some grant uh, restorations done here, specifically in Christiansted and Fredericksted, and it was a full grant and they fixed up the building and within a couple of years, and it's, I'm not as sure it's a question of the materials used, but I think also because the person sort of got the money free, I, uh, within two or three years it started to fall apart and if you see the building today, it looks like it has never been restored. And I think to some degree, if you're not invested in it, like financially, I think you don't care for it quite in the same way. So I have no problem with, with grants, but I think it's, it's a portion of a grant. It may be a grant and you put up a certain amount or a portion is a loan. So it has to be a mixture of these things to, to get you. Or, or it could be like some communities where you have designated contractors that are authorized to build that historical way. Um, some communities have contracted that they'll tell you if, you if you pick a contractor, it has to be one of these. Mm. Well, be certain, so I'm saying there, there, there should be some other measure that the government can say, these are the contractors you can choose from. Mm. Because they know how to build and meet those historical standards. Right. Uh uh, another thing that we are doing, and, and I've done a presentation on this new uh, partnership with Denmark and the, the Architectural and Building Crafts School, but that's exactly the idea. Uh, we can still sometimes find people who are skilled enough to do the level of detailing that's required to build the proper shutters and louvered windows or forged metal for the hardware, etc. Uh, these details that we so uh, desperately need for these buildings, but we don't have the volume volume of craftsmen anymore. And what we are planning is that when you get younger people trained in these decorative and building arts, that you create a pool of individuals who can then be a little more competitive, so hopefully the prices can drop, and just what you describe, where you can have kids that are dedicated to building shutters and building these wonderful louvers. And what is really interesting in the concept is that it's sustainable because these buildings always will have maintenance. It's not that you're going to do it one time, fix it, and forget about it. It's a recycle and recurring thing. So it is a viable, sustainable business in many ways. Building is the easy part. It's the, the, the big key.
All right. I just have a comment. Yes. It would be nice if these lectures could be taken to the schools so kids can have an early appreciation. Yes. Well, I think that's why they're filmed, right? And um, I think what they can do is actually kind of put them on, you know, the public TV and maybe um, put them on CDs and, and give them to classrooms so they can see and learn. Because I think you're absolutely correct, it has to start at a much younger generation. I'm always preaching to the choir and uh, it's, it, we need to kind of get the word out on a bigger scale. Jamil, I just have a question concerning the colors. Yes. Because no matter what paint store I go to and ask for the BI historic colors, no one seems to know which one would it be an ace and Pittsburgh paint or. Yeah, that, that's really strange because the former staff member went around to every paint store and gave them the list. Um, so, but that doesn't surprise me. Um, but we're actually looking at um, another way of doing it where it's more of a formula based so that we know exactly the color and it doesn't necessarily need a brand because you can just give them, this is the mix and that's the color. So we're, we're looking at a different way to handle that. Um, the, the other thing about color, which is on the blog of mine, is that you know way back when these were lime wash paints, which are really much better for the, the type of buildings, these historic rubble and, and lime plaster buildings. But these paints were always matte. So you know when you, you start talking about these acrylics that are really bad, but they are uniform, and then they have either sheen or gloss. So I mean, when you put these on these buildings, I mean, it looks totally different. And when I talk about fluorescent, I mean, that's really part of it, and people just don't get it. And if you were to use the lime wash paint, you would get some variation. There's a lot of tonality, but it also looks a little more aged and a lot more rich. And when you go to other jurisdictions, I mean, in Europe, you go to Asia, and you see these old buildings, and they, they just have these wonderful patina, that's what you would be getting if you did the, the right paint. And the final comment about that is also, if you, we have uh, A to Z can mix um, lime wash paint. A five gallon bucket of lime wash paint is actually cheaper than uh, uh, acrylic paint, latex paint. So it's really interesting that even people don't realize it's, it's cheaper. It does take more maintenance because after the rain, uh, rain can wash it off. But again, it's really easy to apply and it's actually not caustic. And you don't have all that volatile organic compounds that uh, we talk about all the time with acrylic paint. So it's a lot healthier. So. Yeah. I, I wanted to, to follow up on the idea of um, training the young to, um, you know, come into the, um, you know, like shutters um, are, are, you know, fairly well established, um, you know, business that, like you say, could be if it's if it's monetarily um, available, right. or reasonable, uh, you know, you have a nice business going. Um, our boat type program doesn't have any kind of real carpentry that leans into that. It might be an idea to, to bring it up and, and try to incorporate it and try to find a teacher for it. Maybe. Right. Uh, another great idea. Um, years ago in 2000, um, there was a partnership called VITA, Virgin Islands Danish Appre Apprenticeship Program, and it went for five years. And actually, they were taking kids from the vocational school, and they were getting trained in carpentry and masonry and plaster, and they were sent to Denmark and learned. And unfortunately, the program died and fizzled out because the funding was lost on both ends of the pond. And again, that's why, again, this new initiative with the architectural school and building craft school is, is resurging. It's obviously a need for it, and this is how we're going to make these uh, techniques and skill sets come back. Okay. All right. Okay. A second side to um, restoring buildings is finding occupants, businesses, people to be in them. Mm -hmm. Like there's the Tishabir uh, Markle building over on King Street there that's been restored for how many years and it's been shuttered all these years? 26. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I often wonder what is the problem there. There was a little um, gray vernacular um, house, I think it's on East Street, that was I occupied for the longest time. And I just wondered, you know, why is it that these things, these buildings have been lovingly restored, but 
are shuttered and closed or for a long time without having occupants. And the thing is, is the town itself. How many people are interested in being in the town, living day and night in the town? We've had a mass migration through these housing developments through the, the 60s and the 70s. And people say, well, I am a, uh, from the hillside. Um, I am from Gallows Bay. But they live in Tulipan, or they live in Mamushu, or somewhere else. And when they have their reunions, I'm not criticizing, but they have them at Kramer's Park, but they never really come back to the place that they are from, or where they, they are proud to be from, but they never really come back to the place. Mm -hmm. it, it just seems like a chicken and an egg situation here that, mm. that doesn't, doesn't help restoration, and it doesn't help occupancy and town being you know, occupied at night and so forth. So, mm. say something to that. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's a lot to say. Um, um, let me. I'll start with the um, the Shabir building because my understanding of that building is that it floods, and it floods because obviously the the concrete, uh, the asphalt pavement of the street has risen so high that now everything on a heavy rain sort of ponds on that ground floor. So getting a tenant in there is really difficult because I mean, who's going to rent a building that's going to flood? Um, my town plan um, looks at bringing residential, com increased residents back into the town. Because I think until you have the volume of people living in the town, the businesses are not going to be sustainable. So it's, you're right in the chicken and egg. Um, there is a zoning um, component that people are not always aware of, but any zoning designation in town, and actually throughout the entire territory, always allows for a business with the condition that it's owned it's the owner of the business and no more than one um, basically office person or, or uh, sort of working with them. So you can only have two people in a space. And I bring that up because I think to make it viable, especially in the little cottages up where they need to kind of come back and repopulate in both towns, if you allow or you study that so that it comes a live-work situation where you can live in the space and you can operate a small business, and it could be, it could be crafts, it could be making soap, it could be um, basket weaving, and you allow people to generate income where they live, I think what that would help inspire is not only to fix up the building, but you can actually make it profitable and that pays for the building. We have to figure out ways that it's not just to fix up a building and you can't find a good tenant or, and also if you're not gonna always reinvest and sometimes be in the space, because I think we also need property owners to be in these buildings. It's not only to say, let me rent it out and get a rental amount for a business or somebody to live there. You need to have people literally who own it come back in. Because I think there's a, and it needs to be a mix, because when you have people who are property owners, I think the level of pride is a little bit different. And I think I can speak to it personally being in a building that that I am living and having my office space in. And people really do respect that. And I go and pick up the trash outside. If I complain about noise, if I you're doing something illegal, I call the police, they think twice. But you have to be invested in the property. And people relate to you and the space around you a very diff in a very different way. So we have to incentivize and get people to be willing to come back in. And I have a feeling if you got more of a younger generation who I think would absolutely like to be in a more urban setting to come and repopulate the town, I think you'd see a lot more activity. And part of what we want to do with the school is to allow students to live in the town. And that would also be a catalyst. Anyway, What's um, a mic? I don't know who has a mic. The buildings outside the town. Yeah. Yeah. Good night. The buildings outside the town. Outside the 
for example, Sabah, the history of Sabah, yeah. used to be similar to the how they ended up in front of in Shalamu, the Garden School, for example. And there is other areas of suppress the same way that it's occurring. My question is, will the convention have influence with this going outside of the historical structures that you can encourage to that goal and uh, trying to I guess maintain it or enhance it. Because what will happen outside the town, all the historical women in this event. And you have a generation and generation and they have no idea how they used to be in mm books. -hmm. So I don't know if the commission will have influence and go outside the historical town. Uh, in terms of Saban, yes, as well as Charlotte Amelie. Yeah, Garden Street. But again, there's certain areas with outside those jurisdictions that probably not. Um, but you know, if it is a historic building defined as 50 years or older, um, you know, even if it's outside the district, including places like St. Croix, let's say you have a, a stone building that's very old, but it's not within the district, actually you could apply for the federal tax credit. Uh, for for historic rehabilitation, so that is actually another way to do it. Your enterprise zone uh, requirements and and incentives would not apply, but you can do it through the federal government. So okay. that that's another incentive for those types of properties. Okay, and um, my last question is, uh, what is new right now is very good, but the knowledge and information to the public you surprise even a high technology society, and folks have. No idea what going on in terms of your information. Look at tonight, what we you show up. So, public uh, relations are very important to get the message out to the public at large so we know that they do exist. The guys even taking Jordan Barbados, Jordan, in Cuba, and other parts of the Caribbean, where um, the public is really engaged in preserving that historical structure because the government is so much involved. And Almost every other now in the Caribbean is totally driven. Mm. I call it that dominated and everything is totally driven and everybody trying to do his job. But then the boy is surprised as that approach to that know what he's giving us. So maybe a little bit more public uh, outreach. You really be on the channel twelve or wherever it is to already happen like, for example, where the government is building building. That is good for but just to be there to explain to the Caribbean and our family that is good for them, that we do have these incentives mm. that, uh, that you can apply for. That right. thing that I spoke to that know mm. exactly what you're telling us tonight, we do not know that they that do not exist. Right. I, I, I totally agree with you, and that's part of what we have to do. I can't do it by myself. Um, I'll be very frank. Uh, I can only, <laughs> I can only uh, kind of split myself into um, as much, um, you know, speaking engagements that um, can work with my schedule. We do have other board members. One uh, sitting in the middle of uh, <laughs> the audience. So um, we can task every last one of the commission members to co go out and uh, speak a little bit more. I think you're absolutely correct. Um, and different type of fora. I mean, not only here, uh, go to the schools, on TV. Um, we, uh, you, I actually have um, a Facebook page created for, for the committee, but I haven't launched it because if I launch it, it's my responsibility kind of thing. So um, again, um, but I think we really do have to get the word out a lot more. Um, when I said initially that we get vilified a lot, which is true, um, there's a lot of negative comments that are made. I mean, people will see me in my face and, and look at me and say, you know, the problem with this town is that those historic preservation people, and I was like, well, you know, I'm on the commission, so you're, you're talking about me. So, and it's interesting when they come in to uh, do an application and they meet with us, at the end of it, they're like, wow, this was really kind of nice. And we learned a lot and it was, like, it was okay and it wasn't that difficult. And it, so I'm really surprised that there's a lot of negative uh, backlash, but I think it's because people don't know. Yeah, and the farm there is really the spiritual uh, site. They are men themselves, they get together with him at a particular time. 
and they get information and they talk one another and make sure they do correctly. That they know that they get in a tourist dollar, they can go to some of the tourist and they look at the unique structure of building. But then these people were dedicated and they took upon themselves to do themselves. I started looking for the government to do the government to do it for themselves. So maybe in the morning mm. when you give me your car, maybe in the community area that's abided, that's out. Right. Someone, you know, take it off and decide let's do a full argument in what they want to do. Right. And then take the community itself mm. and hopefully it's it's that difference and see the pride in the Mm -hmm. Thank you. My main comment was one to thank you, but also I'm hearing, I'm hearing a couple of things because we've had this conversation before this, so we really want to thank you, get the name off. So I'll just say the Friends of the Park for just having the insight to organize this particular type of lecture series and then we can work with all the different players, whether it's the VI Department of Education, the different divisions that deal with cultural education, particularly to BIDE, University of the Virgin Islands, because I already heard you, Superintendent, so since we have this partnership with the MPS, that we can add that part, that was the reason you saw me kind of tippy toeing up and back, because we were recording this so that we can play it on WUVI, which is at 1090 AM. It is streaming online, www.wubi.am, because every opportunity we have, we try to put these things out. And if persons don't get to listen to it, let's say at a particular time, they can just go to SoundCloud and look for BIC 365 or WUBI.am, and you can look at all of the podcasts from every event that we get a chance to come and get permissions to record. Hmm. So persons can listen if they want to, but at the same time, we want to start making the media message so interactive and getting a few more young people. Like, I love when I see any young person. At this point, anyone under 35. <laughs> I know, they need 20. But I'm just saying that I think that that would help to do what you've been asking for and what I think everybody in the room is trying to see so that we can, it's not even necessarily how many people come in the room, Primo. I think it's really about what, what we do that do come in the room, right? So right. even if it's a small circle and we get a few golf chairs this time, the next time we know that each of us should bring <coughs> another person or to encourage another person to come, you know, and then at the same time we want to make sure that we have the quality of the person that come. We don't need people to just take up the space. We need people that are going to come and really, and that, you know, either be on this wall list, the best are walking around that list with the volunteers, and, you know, or whether it's to work with the commission, you know, or to work with the different organizations that are right here in both towns, right? So. I mean, and you know, UBI is there. there. And we appreciate both <laughs> NPS, UBI, and all the people that came out tonight. So I want to thank everyone and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.